And uh, we're, we're a few minutes late, so I won't uh, take too much time. I just wanted to quickly introduce uh, John Christ uh, with the Farm Bureau. And he is going to be uh, talking to us a little bit today about, about the Farm Bureau itself. And I don't know how familiar all of you are with the Farm Bureau. And talk about some of the things they do, kind of their mission and some of their activities. And then the bulk of the presentation uh, is going to be talking about water, something uh, in the headlines today. And John... And John um, is uh, amateur historian. I think he referred to himself the other day. Anyway, he he it, I've seen this presentation. He's given various forms of it. It's it's amazing, and I think you'll all find it really interesting and valuable to learn about kind of the de water development here in Ventura County over the last uh, century. We'll say plus, maybe two. Okay, two centuries. Anyway, uh, with that, I will turn it over to John. Great. Thanks, John. Right. Thanks, Chris. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, the subtitle of this talk when I when I do just the history part is you know 200 years of water history in 20 minutes. Um, but I'm I'm going to take a little bit more than 20 minutes today. Um, so yeah, I'm the the chief executive officer of the Farm Bureau of Ventura County, and the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about Farm Bureau because I'm sure most of you have have no reason to know who we are or what we do. Um, we're a private nonprofit advocacy organization, and our, our goal is to represent the interests of Ventura County's agricultural industry and agricultural community. Uh, in a variety of, of formats. Um, this is our, our, our mission statement up here. We've, uh, we've been around for 100 years. We're celebrating our centennial this year, um, which is uh, uh, quite an achievement. I think that we're still, uh, you know, um, I'd like to think of us as, as relevant still, um, but our missions change very much in that, in that century. Um, what the things we do, we are, as I said, an advocacy organization. You know, we, uh, we intercede on behalf of the farmers in this county um, in a variety of regulatory, legislative, political uh, venues. Um, we provide, serve an education role. We try to not only provide education to our members about topics that are useful to them in their businesses, but we try to educate the public uh, of Ventura County about agriculture. That's part of our job as well. Uh, everybody sees farming every day, but there's no reason to really understand what's going on out there unless you're engaged in it. So we try to fill that gap. Um, we do provide membership benefits. We have about 1,800 members in this county. About half of those are actively engaged in agriculture. The other half, I believe, join probably because they get a 7.5% discount on the nationwide auto insurance policies. Um, just one of the many benefits we offer. Um, communications, part of our how we do education to the general public and outreach to our members is through a variety of means. Uh, it used to be very simple. We published a newsletter. Um, well, that was in the old days. Uh, now we have a uh, Facebook page, email blast, uh, we're, we're uh, on Twitter, I mean, all these different communication devices. We publish a magazine, a quarterly magazine, which uh, I encourage you, if any of you would like to, uh, to, to receive that publication, just let me know and we'll send it to you. Um, and then we run a number of different programs um, specifically for, for our members. Um, I employ a meteorologist. We have actual weather forecasting service uh, that's available by subscription uh, to our members, uh, primarily forecasting frost, uh, trying to determine whether uh, frost protection is going to be needed during the winter for our members. Uh, our, our meteorologist is woefully ineffective at conjuring rain from the skies, as we've discovered this year. Uh, we have a nonprofit uh, foundation um, that funds scholarships for local students. Uh, we run the Ventura County Agricultural Irrigated Lands Group, which is a uh, group uh, formed to enable the owners of irrigated lands in the county to comply with various state and federal water quality regulations. And this is a huge program uh, that dominates uh, a lot of our, our staff time. Uh, we own the building that we inhabit, so I'm also a landlord with tenants, which I was not prepared for that by my previous career as a journalist. Um, so what are some of the top issues that are facing our, our, our members right now? I just I wanted to run through some of these uh, really quickly. Some of these are, are novel, and most of them are, are the same old things we've been, we've been dealing with for, for a century, pests. Um, the pace of introductions of invasive pests has picked up dramatically in California over the last decade. Uh, whereas you used to get one uh, one a year or so, we're now up to six to ten new introductions every year in this in this state. Um, the one that's at the top of our, our our hit parade right now is the one that's pictured on that uh, banner you see there, the Asian citrus psyllid, uh, which made its way uh, into the county in 2010, and it has the capacity to transmit a disease that's 
uh, fatal, incurable, untreatable, uh, kills all varieties of citrus. Um, so this is a tremendous concern to us. So we do a lot of education outreach. Uh, we work very closely with uh, state agricultural uh, uh, officials and our local agricultural commissioner, Henry is here today, uh, in partnership to try to uh, slow this pest down and make sure everybody knows what they can do to, uh, to, to keep it from spreading across the county and becoming established. Uh, labor, and a huge issue for our members right now. What we do here in Ventura County from an agricultural standpoint is very labor intensive. All the crops we grow are harvested by hand. Um, all the tending is done by hand. There's not really any significant mechanization in our industry. Um, that makes us very sensitive to anything that um, makes it difficult to recruit and retain uh, agricultural workers. And as you probably uh, could guess, this is a, a fairly expensive part of the world to live in and farm work doesn't pay all that well. So we have a real challenge uh, uh, with access to labor. And the last couple of years, because of a variety of changes in border enforcement, demographics, economics uh, between here and Mexico, uh, we've really seen the flow of labor, which has historically always come across the border from one place or another into California, has really slowed. And our our crews the last two years have been anywhere from 10 to 25 percent lower in size, short, smaller in size than they used to be, and it's made it a real challenge to get uh, the crops in in a timely fashion. Um, urbanization. Uh, it's not just the loss of prime farmland to urban conversion, although that is a concern for us. This county loses, on average, over the last 20 years, about 600 acres a year of farmland to, uh, to urban uh, development. Um, but it's also urban encroachment. Uh, you don't have to pave over farmland to make it impossible to farm it. Sometimes all you have to do is build a daycare center across the street. Uh, and that happens a lot in Ventura County. We have what we, what we refer to as a, a very complex ag-urban interface. Just about every farmer has an urban neighbor and uh, that can pose some significant challenges for the continued agricultural use of that property. And then finally, the subject that I'm going to I'm going to spend the rest of the, uh, this afternoon well, not the rest of the rest of my time this afternoon, I should say, uh, talking about and that's water. Uh, you know, it's uh, we we live in a on the edge of a of a desert. We live in a semi-desert down by the coast. The average rainfall is 15 or 16 inches per year. It takes about 40 inches per year to grow a, a crop of strawberries. Um, so, uh, you know, making up that difference is is uh, is what the rest of my presentation is going to be about. How we've gone about. Uh, developing the water resources of Ventura County and making sure we have them uh, in the supply, in the reliable uh, supply that we need. So first, just real quick, um, you know, where, where does Ventura County as a whole get its water and who uses what share of it? So by sector, agriculture in Ventura County uses almost 60% of the, the developed water supply. So it's 60% of 57% of consumptive use. That's a little lower than it would be for the state as a whole. Uh, agriculture statewide uses about, uh, accounts for about 80% of the consumptive uh, use, which is water that's not uh, put to other, other purposes, such as environmental flows for, for, for wildlife and fish. Uh, it's the part that we divert for human, human use. Um, and where does it come from? So the primary local water supply in Ventura County, biggest single source is groundwater, local groundwater. Uh, this makes us very different from um, most other parts of, of the southern half of the state. And uh, that's, uh, let me see, 60%. So 60% of Ventura County's water portfolio is local groundwater. Um, the second largest component is imported state water. And that comes into the county um, through the Cayegas Municipal Water District, which is a wholesaler that serves uh, the actual purveyors that supply it to uh, individual customers. Uh, their service district includes pretty much everything in the county uh, south of the Santa Clara River. So, and they rely entirely on um, imported state water from Northern California. And that supply serves about three quarters of the urban population of the county. In the East County, such as Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, it's the only source of water for those folks out there is imported state water. So you can imagine that the news this year that the state water deliveries for this coming year will be exactly zero is of some consternation to those folks. In the Western County, we're dependent primarily on groundwater and um, local surface water exclusively in, in, in the far Western County, uh, such as Ventura and, uh, and the Ojai area. Um, about 10% of our water portfolio is impounded local surface water, primarily what we see up in Lake Casitas to serve the Ojai Valley, uh, the Ventura River Valley, and some of the beach communities up along the Rincon. And then a very small percentage, but one that I think is probably going to grow, um, is derived from recycled water. We have a couple of projects 
uh, in the county that, uh, that take treated wastewater from um, municipal wastewater treatment plants uh, and recycle it and deliver it to agricultural customers primarily. And that right now is about, about 1% um, of, uh, of the water supply in, in, in Ventura County. From an agricultural standpoint, it's all about groundwater. Um, that's where almost every drop of water we put on crops in Ventura County comes from, is from, from our groundwater basins. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how, how dramatically important those are. Uh, for the most part, we're not relying on any state water to irrigate crops. About Maybe about 5% of the Cayagas deliveries go to agricultural customers. And one of the main reasons that it serves only as a supplemental source is because it's extremely expensive. Uh, it's very difficult to grow crops economically if you're having to pay $1,200 an acre foot for your water. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk history. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, I'm, I, I love dabbling in history. I feel like you can't really tell where you are or where you're going unless you know where you've been. So I like to, like to start out at the beginning. And the earliest days of agriculture in Ventura County coincide with the earliest days of water development in Ventura County. And they both originate um, downtown uh, Ventura uh, around uh, the settlement that, became, uh, that grew up around Mission San Juan de Ventura. So the mission was established in 1782. And that was the first actual agriculture, the raising of crops uh, for subsistence uh, occurred. The Chumash were hunters and gatherers. They didn't grow crops. But when the mission uh, settlements were established, they had to be self-sufficient. So they brought everything they needed to feed themselves and, and the village, the community. So they planted extensive, what they called gardens, um, but they included vineyards, orchards, grain, um, the, whole, the whole nine yards. And so to, as they developed, dis discovered very early on, and it's a recurring pattern, uh, just because you plant stuff doesn't mean it's going to grow unless you bring water to it, and the water tends to be in places where, where, where it doesn't tend to be in the places where it's most needed. So shortly after the establishment of the mission settlement, they built an aqueduct. Uh, and this is the first water d project development in, in Ventura County's history. Uh, the ruins of that Mission Aqueduct are still uh, still visible if you go up to uh, Cañada Larga uh, and turn right at the mouth of that canyon. There's a little pullover where you can park near a chain link fence, and these uh, fragments of that Mission Aqueduct are still visible there. Um, it was built between 1805 and 1815 uh, using native labor, cobbles and mortar, gravity feed. It was seven miles long, brought water from the creek up there all the way down to the Mission uh, community uh, down by the ocean. Uh, it was a fairly sophisticated system. It was gravity feed, but it included filtration, uh, pressure uh, equalizing uh, basins, and all kinds of good stuff. But again, you know, from the very first moments that we were uh, settling and planting crops, we had to do something to develop uh, water. So the mission was also responsible for the first uh, water development on the Santa Clara River system uh, as well. There was a mission outpost um, up uh, near the site of uh, what is today Santa Paula. Um, and so they had a diversion structure on Santa Paula Creek that took water off of that to irrigate row crops along the north side of the Santa Clara River. Um, and again, that was a supplemental food source for both the main mission uh, settlement down here in Ventura, but also for the satellite outpost up there in the Santa Clara River Valley. Uh, it was uh, known to the uh, settlers who came after that as the Old Padre Ditch. Um, but it was just the first of many. This, this, this chart shows the, uh, some, of the, some of those ditches running all the way down here. This is Santa Paula Creek up here. And, you know, this was yeah, 1886. And you can see the walnut orchard, apricot orchard, um, those ditches were adapted by the later settlers uh, to become the net, sort of the um, key core of a, of a much more extensive um, irrigation system. So until the 1860s and 1870s, um, you know, cattle ranching uh, was, livestock ranching was the main thing. Um, and before I go on, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, love, I love this. Uh, so we're really concerned about water quality today, but it's not a new thing. Um, what we worry about, though, has become a little different than, than it used to be. Um, this was uh, taken from a, the, the newspaper. So the, the Santa Paula water supply apparently flowed through a, a hog uh, operation and left the folks in, in, uh, in Santa Paula somewhat perplexed. Um, but as I said, 
the early days of agriculture after the mission period were primarily built around cattle, but in the 1860s, we start seeing really large scale um, settlement and agricultural development in Ventura County. Uh, and so one of the first things that had to be done as those farms started growing was bringing water to them as well. So in addition to things like the old Padre Ditch, the old water works that were here, uh, we see those early growers starting to develop a wide range of, of primarily surface water diversions. Uh, the creeks, um, this is an intake uh, flume off the Santa Clara River. One of the things that's important for us to, to, to remember is that at this time, before there'd been any real large scale uh, groundwater use or, or diversions, uh, and we we're probably in a slightly different uh, climatic um, uh, regime, that river flowed above ground most of the year. You could do surface diversions off the Santa Clara River because it flowed like a real river uh, more often than we see today. Um, so you had a number of these intake flumes uh, and, uh, and diversions being built. Um, here's just a, just a quick summary of, of some of the ones that, uh, that were built in the Santa Clara system. Farmers Canal, uh, you know, bringing water to Ventura from, again, Santa Paula. Santa Clara uh, Canal bringing from Satakoy to Wainimi, um, the Southside Improvement Company. All these, these, these farm uh, owners got together to build these things. And you know, some, of, some of them, you can see, they're moving, a, lot of, moving a, a fair amount of water. But as agriculture continued to expand and um, moved into other places on, in Ventura County that were more difficult to serve uh, through these gravity feed ditches taking water off the river, um, we start seeing a change uh, and a reliance on, more reliance on groundwater. Now, this is a map from the uh, Watershed Protection District. We have a tremendous amount of storage in our underground aquifer systems throughout this county. Um, basically, the equivalent of, uh, what are we looking at, about six Lake Shastas, which is the, the big linchpin uh, reservoir in California, the biggest one in, reservoir in California. It's the linchpin of the Central Valley uh, project. Um, there's a lot of water under the ground in Ventura County, which makes us uh, extremely fortunate. Um, and so those early, early growers who really wanted to step up and, and irrigate more crops but didn't have access to river diversions started sinking wells. And out on the Oxnard Plain in particular, but also um, moving on, on up the Santa Clara River Basin, uh, those aquifer systems were un, in artesian conditions, which is that the pressure in there was so great that if you punched a hole in the aquifer, the water came out all by itself. You didn't have to pump it. Um, you, could, you could drill down 150 feet and the water would come out of the ground with enough force to raise it to the second story of a farmhouse, um, all without, without pumping. And so we start seeing a really, really widespread um, reliance on, on these groundwater uh, resources. Um, this is again a, a, a piece from, uh, from the newspaper describing this, uh, the tremendous capacity of these, some of these wells that could be drilled uh, and plumbed for, for a relative pittance. Um, one thing I love about this is that they're quoting an experienced ditchman. Um, it's a job description we don't really see anymore. Um, but with more, all of this pumping, with more, well, pumping with all of these wells going in and more and more reliance on, on these we start seeing the groundwater levels in these basins fall. Um, and this has a number of consequences. The thing I love about this is, so there's a, there's a photographer taking this picture, but this is such a momentous event that he captures another photographer also taking a picture of this well. It was such a big deal to drill that first well at Satakoy. We've got not one, but two, two people with giant cameras on tripods commemorating the event. Um, so as we start really expanding um, uh, development of groundwater and use of groundwater, um, we start seeing the groundwater basins um, decline and the groundwater levels uh, uh, decline. And the artesian conditions go away. Uh, water no longer bubbles to the, out of the ground all by itself. You gotta start pumping. Um, and as it continued, uh, agriculture continued to expand and as the groundwater levels continued to drop, we see a cessation of those year-round surface flows in the rivers. Uh, the basins became empty enough that the rivers sort of sink out of sight during the dry season. Uh, and we also see the formation of a lot of these mutual water companies, which are essentially a group of agricultural landowners banding together to raise the capital for large-scale projects. So they're, they're installing really big wells, deep wells, uh, and then building distribution systems to serve all of their, uh, all of their members. 
and I have to say, you know, this is just a partial list of some of these mutual water companies. I believe all but maybe one or two of those are still, still in existence today, and they are still delivering water uh, to farmers in Ventura County. Um, so they start bringing in um, pumps. Uh, some of them um, were steam powered. Uh, some of them were electric. Uh, electric, but they're pretty, uh, pretty significant major, uh, major capital investment required for this this sort of thing. But it's very effective. Uh, really enables agriculture to compensate for the, the falling aquifer levels uh, and continue uh, the the expanding uh, nature of, of agricultural production. But of course, things change. Uh, agriculture was was first. There was no significant urban population here, but um, we start seeing cities grow up in Ventura County as well, um, and thirstier crops using more water, uh, people relying on on this resource, and so we start seeing um, a lot of challenges develop uh, over time, and we start seeing a lot of competition over access to these to these water resources, and this kind of changes. Um, some of some of how we're handling uh, the management of these resources, uh, and it also starts pitting one region of, of the state against the other. Um, you know, Ventura County is right on the edge of Los Angeles County, and um, they have something of a history that everybody knows about of going far away to find water to bring it to the uh, to the, the folks, the neighborhoods of Los Angeles. So as early as 1925, growers here were worried about the city of L.A. coming up here and making a grab for Ventura County's water. And so uh, they formed the Santa Clara River Protective Association to try to try to keep uh, control over that key water resource here in Ventura County. Um, and they were reacting directly to what had happened up in the Owens Valley. Uh, and uh, they also reacting to uh, something else that L.A. County, L.A. had done very much closer to us. So this is the St. Francis Dam. Uh, it was on a, one of the major tributaries of the Santa Clara River, just over the L.A. County line, San Francisquito Creek. Uh, and this, this dam came out of nowhere. The folks in, in, in Ventura County were caught entirely by surprise when the, the L.A. Department of Water and Power built this dam on a tributary of our primary water source here in Ventura County. Um, construction was underway before they realized it was there. Uh, and this really ignited uh, a lot of, uh, um, I wouldn't say paranoia, if it's justified, I guess it's not paranoia, um, uh, but a, a lot of consternation and concern in the county for how do we secure and protect our, our resources and make sure that they remain uh, available for us. Uh, of course, we had another reason to be very unhappy about uh, St. Francis Dam. That's what it looked like after March 12th. Uh, the dam failed uh, catastrophically one night and unleashed uh, a flood that to, the, to this day I believe is the mo single most destructive in terms of lost life uh, event in California history. It killed more than 500 people in the Santa Clara River Valley. Uh, bodies washed up as far south on the ocean uh, as San Diego. So we did a bunch of things here locally uh, in response. Um, as I said, the Santa Clara River Protective Association was formed, um, and then we gradually, this expanded into not just defending our water resources from encroachment from outside, but also finding better ways to, to manage and to augment them locally. Um, so as you can see, the uh, you know, Santa Clara River Water Conservation District, um, conservation in this sense is, is uh, trying to conserve the uh, sustainability of that resource, if that, and that sometimes involves putting more water back in the ground artificially, which of course is what, what they did. So we have all these different steps. We built, we built dams. Um, we built uh, recharge facilities. Uh, we have two surface water reservoirs in, in Ventura County. I mentioned earlier Lake Casitas is one of them. Um, but we also, the other one is Lake Piru uh, in the East County. I'll talk a little bit more about this um, later. But so we brought all these, all these new things online. And then um, after the state water project was, uh, began being developed in the early 60s, the Cayegas Municipal Water District was formed here too. Uh, to bring imported water in, into the county. Now, not all of our projects have been really successful. Um, Matillaha Dam was uh, built by the local folks despite projections by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that would not provide sufficient water supply or flood control benefits to justify being built. Um, they built it anyway, and now it holds back about 500 acre feet of water and 6 million cubic yards of sediment. So not terribly successful. Um, others have been extremely successful. So this is the Vern Freeman diversion. 
Um, this helped reverse one of the real huge problems that arose, began developing in the middle of the 20th century uh, as we continued to draw more water out of our coastal aquifers than uh, was being replenished by rainfall and, and percolation. Um, we had seawater intruding into that aquifer and rendering wells along the coast unusable because of very high chloride um, uh, content. There had been primitive diversions on the Santa Clara to take water off at times of high flow and spread them out in settling ponds so it could sink into the ground and replenish those aquifers. Um, but until the Vernon Freeman opened in 1991, these were basically, they'd drive bulldozers out of the river and push up sand berms uh, to do that diversion. And of course, that would all be lost the next time there were flood flows in the river. Um, so the Freeman was intended to be a structural uh, response to that. And it operates in conjunction with a num number of facilities. <laughs> you can tell this was taking a long time ago. But that, that That's a conservation release from Lake Piru, from Santa Felicia Dam. Um, in a normal year, in late summer, early fall, the United Water Conservation District, which operates um, uh, Santa Felicia Dam, releases water from that dam that's been impounded during the winter. And it flows uh, down the Santa Clara River to the Freeman and gets diverted. Uh, so we can do additional uh, recharge in, uh, in the aquifers long after the storm season has passed. It also uh, can be put into pipelines and delivered to growers out there so they don't have to use their own wells. Uh, there was no conservation release this year because Lake Piru is at less than 20% of capacity, uh, and there probably will not be one this year. Um, but that's Lake Piru's purpose, is it impounds surface water so that it can be used to recharge groundwater. Um, so that's, that's what it's there for. So we've got these settling ponds out near Satakoy and El Rio. Um, and under normal circumstances, and historically that system has worked very well for many years, it did enable us to reverse the seawater intrusion problem and put a lot more water back in the ground so that uh, growers could continue to irrigate. Um, I, 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 I just have to show this. That's what the Freeman looks like in a, in a wet year. Um, it's underneath that lip there. So that's, the, that's what the Santa Clara River is supposed to look like in the winter time. It doesn't look like that in a while. Um, but again, it's, it can be very, very effective at diverting water uh, to recharge the aquifers. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that are facing all of these water uh, sources we have. So we've got, we've got groundwater, we've got uh, local surface water, we've got imported water. Uh, all of these sources are under a considerable amount of stress right now, and, it, and, it's, and that predates the drought. Uh, the drought is making things worse, but it's not the cause of these problems. So the Fox Canyon Aquifer System is the big aquifer system that underlies most of the Oxnard Plain. It's where uh, more than half of the irrigated acreage in the county uh, is located. Um, and that's, that's where most of our, our economic output from agriculture occurs, and it's all dependent on this aquifer system uh, for irrigation water. Um, it's managed by a groundwater management agency that uh, tries to determine what the, what the safe yield of the basin is and then make sure everybody's um, using an appropriate amount of water to stay within that. Um, the problem is we've had a number of things change out there. For one thing, the safe yield is lower than we thought it was when we set the system up. Part of that's because we didn't really understand the uh, hydrogeology as well as we needed to, as well as we thought we did. Uh, we've also seen reductions in the amount that can be recharged uh, through diversions at the Freeman because of uh, considerations about endangered species that require us to let water go past the Freeman uh, to sustain fisheries. Uh, we didn't used to have to do that. Another change has been a, a change in cropping patterns out on the Oxnard Plain. We've lost uh, probably about 12,000 acres of, uh, of lemon orchards, and they've been replaced by 12,000 acres of strawberries, which uses uh, not quite twice as much water per acre, but, but almost. Uh, so we've seen an intensification of per acre water use out there uh, at the same time that we've seen a reduction in the safe yield of the basin due to other factors. So the end result is, although we had reversed the seawater intrusion and the overdraft conditions that we first began noticing in the, in the 40s and 50s, um, that condition has returned. And even in an av a wet year, we're overdrafting that basin by uh, about 25,000 acre feet of water per year. It's a lot of water. So this is the main surface water uh, project. This is uh, that's Lake Casitas, the uh, Robles Diversion um, Gates there on the Ventura River. Um, Lake Casitas impounds a lot of water that flows naturally off the surface in, uh, in, in its watershed, but it's 
augmented by diversions out of the Ventura River that go into the uh, the uh, Robles Diversion Canal and feed directly into the into the lake. So again, um, just as we've seen reductions in the Freeman's diversion capacity because of the need to maintain flows for uh, endangered steelhead, that's the primary uh, reason. The same thing confronts the, the operators of this. This is operated by Casitas Municipal Water District, uh, and there are steelhead in the Ventura River as well. So they've seen reductions in their diversion capacity uh, due to the need to keep flows um, there for, for fish, fish passage. And of course, the, the, that other big source of water for us, the state project, has its own, its own challenges that, again, predate uh, this year's dramatic announcement that there would be no state water project deliveries. That's the first time that that has happened since the state project opened for business back in the 60s. Um, that's drought related, but there are longer term issues um, associated with the state project system that make it very, very vulnerable to, uh, to make it very unreliable, I guess we should say. Um, so this is, this is the, the sort of nexus of the problems. So the state project, like the Central Valley Project, originates up in the San Francisco Bay Delta region. The pumps are down here at the south end of this big estuary where the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers sort of mingle and then go into San Francisco Bay and make their way out to the Golden Gate. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. It's a, a maze of, of sloughs and canals. It's like a little piece of Louisiana transferred into the heart of California. Um, and it's, uh, it's got about a half a million people in it. It's got about a half a million acres of agriculture in it. Um, but it's real critical importance is it's the place where uh, the water that goes to 25 million Californians originates. And the system is in trouble. Uh, and it's for a variety of reasons. This, this gives you one idea of what's, what goes on up there. It's, the ecology of the delta is in, under severe strain. We've got fish populations crashing. And much of this is laid at the feet of the projects that divert so much water out of the south of the delta. They fundamentally alter the flows of water uh, in, throughout the system. So these rivers are supposed to be going over here. They're not supposed to come down here and then make U-turns and head south. But those pumps are so powerful, they actually re reverse the flows in the rivers. Uh, that's to put it uh, to put not to put too fine a point on it. That's a little confusing for fish. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, the populations are are in such trouble. One of the results has been court ordered reductions in the diver in the pumping, um, and that's had a tremendous impact on the amount of state water that's available here to the south. Um, so again, delta smelt, uh, steelhead, salmon, uh, all of these are are causing complications for reliance on the state project. Um, the other big risk that the state project poses is in the event of an earthquake, much of that delta, the dikes holding the seawater back would fail and we would see the ocean moving back into the delta and potentially forcing those pumps to be shut down. And that could, uh, that there's an estimated two and three chance of something like that happening in the next uh, 15 years. So that would be, that would be catastrophic. So. All right, so that's where we are. Now I want to talk real briefly before we run out of time here about where we are now and where, where things might be going uh, in terms of agricultural water use in Ventura County. And again, this is, this is a wild card. We don't really know what this is going to mean long term, but that's the bug I was talking about at the very beginning, uh, this pest that scares the heck out of us. It's the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, we're, we're fighting it uh, off right now, but if the disease that it transmits uh, becomes widespread in Ventura County and we start losing lots and lots and lots of acres of citrus. It's going to fundamentally change the shape and the, the face of agriculture in this county. We have about 25,000 acres of citrus trees in this county. It's a quarter of the total. Um, if that all succumbs to a fatal illness, uh, I'm not quite sure what that will do, um, but it will definitely change uh, what, we, what we farm in Ventura County. And the historical trend is whatever replaces something like citrus is going to use more water. Um, it's going to be something like strawberries or, or vegetables. Um, this is another big piece of the, f of the future, possibly. Um, this is a shot from inside a hydroponic tomato hothouse out on the Oxnard Plain. Really tremendously uh, productive in terms of the amount of output per unit of input. Uh, it's roughly 30 times as productive as open field tomato production, uh, but it uses 
a lot more water per acre as well. You know, a tomato is 80% water by weight. So essentially we're pumping groundwater out, turning it into tomatoes, and then shipping it all over North America. And so I guess we could ask them to send the water back when they're done with it. But I, I really don't know of an effective return mechanism uh, like the tomato for getting it out of here. Um, but again, if we see increasing uh, shift to this kind of production, we're going to see, again, intensification of, of, of water use in Ventura County. And this is, this is one of the, the rare hopeful uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle. This is a reverse osmosis unit out at a treatment plant that the city of Oxnard has built. Um, they have since scaled this up to a re remarkable degree. This was built to take salt out of brackish groundwater uh, to augment the city's supply. But they've built a much bigger version of this that eventually will be able to uh, purify the entire effluent stream from their municipal wastewater treatment plant uh, and make it available for irrigation, uh, landscaping, uh, irrigation, agricultural irrigation, and, and other purposes. Uh, there's tremendous potential here to, to at least cut into that overdraft problem out on the Oxnard Plain. Um, as long as we can resolve the issues of, you know, plumbing, getting the water to where it needs to be, pricing, uh, making it affordable so growers can actually make money using it uh, to irrigate their crops, um, and perception. We've got to make sure everybody understands that wastewater that goes through an RO plant is cleaner than anything that you're drinking right now. Um, so um, I think those are all over easily, not easily, but they can all be overcome, and we can bring an additional new supply into the county this way. This is the big wild card. I had to throw in a drought image. Um, this is not just a dry year. This is an epically dry year. Um, and we're fortunate here in Ventura County. We've been somewhat insulated from the effects of the drought, uh, particularly compared to the folks up in the Central Valley who are entirely dependent on uh, deliveries from the State Water Project or the Central Valley Project. Um, down here, because we are primarily reliant on local groundwater supplies, those are still there. Uh, so we haven't seen widespread fallowing of farmland uh, because water deliveries have been cut off. Um, we are, however, overdrafting the heck out of all of our aquifers. We've had wells go dry up in the Ventura River Valley and the Ojai Valley. Um, you know, the longer we go without rain, the more likely that some of these, uh, these problems that arise in our groundwater basin are going to take years to, uh, to reverse. Um, the other thing is you don't have to lose water for the drought to, to have an effect. Uh, if we don't have free water falling out of the sky, you're spending money to pump. And so the economic hit to the growers has been rather significant. They're irrigating in January. They're not supposed to be irrigating in January. Mother Nature is supposed to do that for us. Um, the other thing is irrigation is fairly inefficient at driving, flushing salts from the soil. Rainfall is very good at that. Um, so the more, longer you irrigate, the more the salts build up in the soil, and that has a detrimental effect on plant health and vigor and crop yield. Uh, we're already seeing a lot of very stressed avocado trees around the county with uh, lots of chloride tip burn uh, from the salt in the soil. Uh, ultimately, if that, if that doesn't get reversed, it's going to start uh, reducing their yields. But what really, what, what's really frightening is the, the notion that we could, this could be not just an aberration. This could be sort of a, the new normal of the cycle we're entering. There are epically draw, long 10, 20-year droughts uh, in, the historic, in the prehistoric record uh, for our area where we just basically don't see rain for more than a decade at a time. So this is why you're hearing a lot about, uh, about drought coping strategies and so on. Um, one thing I hope doesn't happen as a result of all this stress on the system, and that's, uh, that's this. I mean, we've been very good historically in Ventura County about cooperatively managing our water resources, whether they're, they, they be groundwater or surface water, uh, developing these associations and, and districts to manage and, and defend our, our water resources. Um, but all that, that collaboration, cooperation is easy when, uh, when things are plentiful. Uh, it's when things get scarce that you really start seeing the test of these um, agreements, these policies, these structures. And this is, this is sort of, this is, this is what we don't want to have happen is everybody suing each other or, or getting out the shovels and shotguns. So just again, a real quick uh, recap, you know, the 200-year the, the, the history of water development here. So we had... Competition, uh, early days, giving way to collaboration um, as, as things got uh, more developed. We had small scale by development by private individuals uh, using basically what nature had provided, year-round surface flows, uh, artesian groundwater basins, uh, followed by a different uh, phase where settlement and irrigation expanded greatly. And uh, we saw the need of, uh, for people to band together and for entrepreneurs to play a role in uh, developing 
more sophisticated water uh, resource projects. Uh, and then we see a period of depletion that we were so effective at, uh, at tapping those groundwater sources and those surface water sources uh, and expanding irrigated agriculture that we started having a deleterious effect on those critical resources. Um, and we start seeing things like, like seawater intrusion. Um, but this then gives birth to a whole new, new type of collaboration where we're not collaborating or cooperating just to develop the water resources, but to better manage them uh, for the long haul. Um, but again, you know, those systems have served us very well for a very long time. And the, the question now is, you know, what can we do to make sure that they continue to serve us well in a very different kind of world uh, than the one that they were developed in? So with that, I'll stop bending your ear, and I'm happy to take any questions anybody has, if I can answer them. Yes. How are farmers starting to adapt to the to this water? Well, I mean, yeah. It's a, really, it's a really good question. You know, I think one of the things that the, the particular challenges that agriculture has, um, particularly compared to urban water users, okay, if the city of Ventura tells me to cut back my water use 20 or 30 percent, well, you know, an average, average residential water use, 50 percent of it's for outdoor landscape irrigation. So I'll kill my lawn. Easy. Done. No big deal. Um, you know, if the water ever comes back, I'll replant it. Um, if I've got 800 acres of lemons, I can't turn off the water, they'll die. And that's a millions and millions of dollars of investment lost, not to mention um, decades of, of, of profits down the drain. And I'm already only giving them the amount of water they need to survive and produce crops. So I can't really cut it back. So conservation has a whole different kind of meaning in the, in the ag world than it does in the urban world. Um, the demand's a lot harder. It's very difficult to respond here in Ventura County to water shortages by fallowing ground. Uh, up the Central Valley, where most of the people own, own their farmland, and by the way, it's, it's, it's fairly inexpensive, they're going to have some tough choices to make. You know, maybe they'll water the almond orchard because that's, after all, a 25, 50-year investment, and they won't plant the cotton field or the, or the alfalfa field. They'll just let that ground stay uh, empty this year. In Ventura County, if it's not covered with orchards, it's covered probably by berries or vegetables, and most likely that land is being leased from a, from a landlord for three or four thousand dollars an acre per year whether or not you plant anything on it at all so following it doesn't mean it means you're going to lose money uh, you might not lose as much money as you would if you planted strawberries and your crop died because we ran out of water before uh, you were able to harvest um, so we have very limited options uh, here um, so a lot of there's a lot of interest right now in well there's a lot of interest in developing new supplies and to some degree that might involve um, building small-scale treatment plants to take some of the really crummy groundwater that we've got out there that's not usable right now and treating it for use. Uh, and there are a lot of solutions being explored for, um, you know, making better use of that water that's coming out of Oxnard's recycling thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, for a lot of those folks, it's, it amounts to praying for rain. Uh, there are no easy solutions out there. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, that's a real tough question. So the first question is fairly easy. The leases they tend to range between one and three years. Three years is fairly common um, uh, for the leases. And again, that's a that's a berry and vegetable thing. You know, you don't you don't plant an orchard on leased ground. Uh, so the the citrus and avocado uh, land tends to be owned by the people who farm it. Um, so in terms of what is a crop that could be profitable but also use less water, that's, that's a really good question. I, you know, there are lots of crops we have grown here historically in Ventura County that use much less water than uh, celery or strawberries. Um, but again, you know, we were once the lima bean capital of the world. Well, lima beans are worth about $1,200 an acre, gross. You can't make money on $4,000 uh, an acre ground with $1,200 an acre crop. So that's really not an economic option. Uh, whether or not there's something, a lot depends on how much we need to, we need to reduce use um, and what mechanisms, 
are available to do that. Right now, a lot of the, the emphasis in the ag community is not on reducing use so much as it is finding supplemental sources, untapped sources, ways to move water differently around the county than we do now um, so that it can go from places of relative scarcity to places, or from places of relative abundance to places of relative scarcity. Um, so I think that's the direction people are going are gonna to be looking. I, I suppose the whole, you know, land rent the price model may go belly up if it turns out you can't farm profitably at $4,000 an acre for a lease. Um, but there's this big disconnect between the people who own that land and the people who are farming it in, in some cases. So, yeah, Martine. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So Martine's question is, what about the promise of uh, seawater desalination? The Pacific's a pretty big uh, reservoir. And yeah, the, you know, there have been discussions. Every coastal community has these discussions every time there's a drought. Um, and I guess what I would say is that if you look at the range of options, seawater desal is always going to be the most expensive one. Uh, it's so energy intensive to desalinate seawater that the Production cost essentially winds up being about $2,500 an acre foot, um, which is more than twice as much as we're spending to import Northern California water 400 plus miles all the way down here. Uh, and it's well, considerably more than the 350 or so per acre foot that the groundwater users are, are, are paying. Um, so I think before we get there, we'll do things like desalinate Brackish groundwater has a much lower total dissolved solid content, so the energy investment's not as high. It's cheaper to, to purify. Um, and the same thing goes for municipal wastewater. You know, we've got wastewater treatment plants in Fillmore, Santa Paula, now in Oxnard, that are producing water of a, of a, of a quality that could be recycled. Um, we have the Cayegas Municipal Water District investing couple of hundred million dollars in a salinity management pipeline uh, that's going to extend all the way from the beach at Port Wyneme ultimately up to Simi Valley at Thousand Oaks. And the purpose of that is to enable uh, desalters or these recycling plants in the cities of Camarillo, Simi, Moor Park to come online and have a place to dispose of the waste brine. Um, so I think there's a lot of capacity there. That's a critical back, piece of backbone infrastructure that will enable us to make better use of these resources. So again, that's bringing more water online. It's water, you know, we're at the end of the pipeline. You can't, it's just ridiculous to spend all that money to bring water down here all the way from the Feather River watershed in Northern California, use it once and flush it out to the ocean. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing that a whole lot longer. So, Yes. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. So the question, does the um, proliferation of hoop houses out there have an effect on, on, on the water, water, water use, water recharge, I, I suppose? The answer is probably, it probably does. Um, and in fact, um, a couple of the UC Cooperative Extension uh, farm advisors here in Ventura County are um, engaged right now in a, a research project, both here in Ventura, but also up in Santa Barbara County, to try to quantify what happens to infiltration and recharge um, and runoff if you cover an entire, you know, 100-acre field in, in plastic hoop houses. Uh, now all that rainfall is going to go someplace. Uh, it's not going to percolate right into the ground there. Um, so we, we don't know what the, what the answer is to that, but I'm sure it has some impact. Um, you know, the, we have seen a great deal of hoop house development here, also up in northern Santa Barbara County. A lot of it here is due to raspberry uh, production. That's the primary thing. But we're seeing a lot of hoops go over strawberries now, too. There's some varieties that really um, need that protection from, from wind and sun and, and rain, and they do really well. The yields are much higher if you do that. So um, that is proliferating. So, yeah, it's, it has an unknown impact, but certainly does have an impact. Yes. No, not really. The, the crop needs this, you know, the ET rate's the same no matter what you're, what you're doing. You can reduce water use to some degree through a number of, of steps, but 
you know, our conventional growers are as apt to use mulch and that sort of thing as, as the organic growers. It's just a good agricultural practice. It's more efficient. You get a lot of multiple benefits out of it. So basically all of our orchard folks are mulching. Um, and yeah, in terms of the organic, there's really, it's, it's, it's the same plant really. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you all for your, uh, your time and attention.